Are you looking to become a master at Pokemon Go PvP and learn everything there is to know? Well, you've come to the right place. Today, we're gonna to be breaking down PvP, a full guide including beginner tips and mechanics, intermediate tips, and advanced expert tips for you to learn. We even have a special guest featured at the end of this video, so let's get right into it, starting with beginner tips and tricks for Pokemon Go PvP. So first we need to understand some basic mechanics, starting with fast moves. How do fast moves work? Every time you tap the screen, you'll be firing a fast move in Pokemon Go. And different fast moves will take different amount of time. Fast moves are broken up into things called turns, and this is a very important mechanic to know. Turns are 0.5 second increments that a fast move will happen in. Fast moves can range from one to five turns. So say you have a fast move that happens every single turn, that's gonna be a fast move every single 0.5 seconds. But if you have a fast move that takes five turns, that's a fast move every 2.5 seconds. Simple math. Once you have tapped on the screen, you are fast move lock, which means you cannot do any other action until that fast move completes. So if you do tap the screen on a 2.5 second fast move, aka five turns, you cannot do anything in a PvP battle for 2.5 seconds. Very important to know. Now, what type of fast moves are in the game? Well, there's a variety of fast moves that Niantic have added to the game, and these fast moves are based on moves from the main series games. Take a Pokemon like Rayquaza, for example. Rayquaza cannot learn Mud Shot in the main series games, so it can never get the fast move Mud Shot in Pokemon Go. Generally, once a Pokemon is released, it will be stuck with its fast moves unless we get a new fast move introduced through a community day or a special event, or every single three months in Pokemon Go PvP, Niantic does do a switch up in which a Pokemon could get a new fast move or a fast move could get buffed or nerfed. Now, all fast moves are a certain type, of course, and they correlate to the type they are in the main series games. However, no, depending on the type of fast move will show if you're doing super effective or non-super effective damage on that Pokemon because you are doing that type of damage. If I'm using a ground type fast move, I am giving ground type damage with my fast move. Now, if two different Pokemon know the same type of fast move, just note that that fast move is gonna be the same for both those Pokemon. If both Empoleon and Kyogre know the fast move Waterfall, those stats on that fast move and those Pokemon are gonna be the exact same since it's the exact same fast move. The damage might be a little different because of base stats, but that's important. Fast moves, of course, deal X amount of damage depending on the fast move. Some deal more, some deal less, but most of them deal damage, except one, I think. Every time you use a fast move as well, you will gain a certain amount of energy and you will see that by that little bar filling up on your charge moves, which we will cover soon. Each Mon can hold up to 100 energy. And so once that bar is full, that means you have 100 energy and you can never go more than 100 energy at a certain point. You can still tap your fast move and do damage with your fast move when you're at 100 energy, but just note you won't be gaining any more energy. So it's kind of a waste of using a fast move because the whole point of fast moves is to get energy to use your charge moves. Different fast moves will generate more energy. Different fast moves will generate less energy. And of course you can tell if a move generates more energy, it usually will do less damage and vice versa. Game balance, right? Finally, you can change your fast moves using fast TMs and it will switch your fast move to a completely new different fast move. Or you can use elite fast TM, which will allow you to instantly pick what fast move you want on your Pokemon, but these are rare and generally used to get legacy fast moves, which are moves that were only available during past events. That's a perfect segue into charge moves. Now, every Pokemon, when you catch it, will be given a charge move, and charge moves, of course, will deal a certain amount of damage, and they will take a certain amount of energy. So if you charge up to 100 energy, use a charge move that takes 50 energy, you will be stripped of that energy to use that charge move. Again, charge moves do have a certain type, so if you're using a psychic type charge move, you're doing psychic type damage, and it has nothing to do with the type of your Pokemon is. Another important thing, charge moves take one turn to act so it takes 0.5 seconds to use a charge move. It's not just instantly thrown when you tap on your charge move. You can also get two charge moves on every single Pokemon. It will cost you candy and Stardust, and depending on the Pokemon, it'll determine the amount. This allows you to have two potential charge moves you can throw, which is great for, you know, covering your weaknesses. So if you're like a fire type and you're weak to water, you could have a grass type charge move to cover that. Of course, just like fast moves, you can change it with a charge jam and an elite charge jam, allowing you to get any certain one. And when you do use a charge move, you're gonna have to do this attack animation. You have to collect these buttons bubbles and that will affect how much damage you actually do. The less bubbles you swipe in this animation, the less damage you will do. And there are some scenarios where you actually don't want to get all bubbles, but for most of you beginners from the start, you will want to get every single bubble. I actually do have a video on the channel breaking down how to do every single fast move animation the easiest. If you're struggling with any of them, click the link below to that. Also, here is a graph showing you how many bubbles you need to actually get to hit the excellent and which ones you can actually miss one bubble on to still get the excellent for the charge move animation. Now, before we continue, a very important technique based on these moves is going to be farming down. And this is a Term you will hear a lot in this community. Farming down just pretty much means KOing a Pokemon with your fast moves. Instead of throwing a charge move to KO a Pokemon, you want to farm them now with your fast moves so that you have energy going into the next Pokemon and you can threaten with charge moves then. If you were to just kill a Pokemon with your charge move, you had no energy and then you'd have to pretty much rebuild up all the energy with that new Pokemon when they're building up energy. It's just not a situation you want to be in. There's a couple ways to get in this scenario. Number one, if you throw a charge move and the opponent Pokemon is low, you can simply just farm them down by killing them with fast moves. Number two, something called over farming. Sometimes you have a move that 
that can really one shot your opponent, but you don't want to throw it the second you get. This is called over farming by going over the amount of energy you actually need to throw a certain charge move. When you do land that charge move, you have a little bit of extra energy going into the next matchup. Number three is going to be called undercharging that leads to farming down. Undercharging is not getting every single bubble on your charge move animation because you will do less damage. Doing less damage will allow you to put your opponent into the red health or low health in which then you can farm them down. This is more of an advanced technique, but I'm just gonna say it now since it correlates. But usually you will want to not get every single bubble, maybe go for a nice or a great, bring that opponent to a low amount of health and then you can farm them down and have energy going into the next match. All in all though, farming down is a very important technique to know in Pokemon Go and something you will be using very, very often to allow you to get the edge in matchups. Okay, the game would be broken if you could just throw charge moves and land them and it would just be a battle of who's got the best charge. In comes shields in Pokemon Go. Every opponent at the start of the game are given two shields that they can utilize throughout a match. You can use a shield anytime your opponent throws a charge move, but again, you only have two of them. So once you've used two of them, any charge move your opponent throws will hit you no matter what. The shield will pretty much just stop all damage being done by that opponent's Pokemon. One quick tip for shields, by the way, is to look at the shield color. If when you block a move, the shield is red, that means you blocked a super effective charge move. So it was a good block because that move would have done a lot of damage. If you see the shield color is blue, that means you blocked a not very effective charge move and it probably wouldn't have done a lot of damage. Finally, if the shield is a purplish, neutral, bluish kind of color, that means that move would be neutral. It would do a little bit of damage, but it wasn't super effective or resistant. Other mechanic you can do in a Pokemon Go PvP batch is swap. Of course, you come in with three Pokemon every time you battle and you can switch into those Pokemon. Swapping also does take one turn, so 0.5 seconds to actually make it happen. And you do it by just clicking one of those Pokemon in the bottom right corner. Note, however, once you swap in a PvP matchup, you will not be able to swap for the next minute. You can get into a scenario where it's called swap locked and you switch into a Pokemon and they bring in something that is really good against your Pokemon and then you can't switch out of it. You're just gonna kind of have to accept your fate. Swapping, although can be very useful in the game, it is a very important thing to watch out for getting swap locked because you can be put in a very bad scenario. Okay, one of the most important things for any beginner to advance to an intermediate and expert level is going to be learn your typings. There are a total of 18 types in Pokemon Go and different types will do more damage or less damage to your opponent's Pokemon. This is what can give you an edge in a PvP battle. If you have a Pokemon that does fire type fast moves and charge moves against a Pokemon that is a grass type, you're gonna be laughing all the way to the bank in that matchup. The best way to learn your types is number one, play a lot of PvP. You will learn the Pokemon and you will learn what does well. Number two, there are apps out there that will allow you to practice your types and teach you more about types. There is one on iPhone called PvP Trainer that will allow you to practice your types. And number three, watch my video. I have a video I will link below, breaking down every single type in Pokemon Go and how to remember what is good against each other. I will throw a type chart on screen. This is kind of like how it works. So you can get a general idea, but learning what is good against other Pokemon is important. However, it's not really that simple since some Pokemon are actually two types. Let me do my best to explain. Typing in Pokemon Go pretty much just applies a multiplier to the amount of damage you're gonna do. If a Pokemon resists a certain type, which means you take less damage from that type, for example, fire on water, water resists fire type moves, you will take 0.625 times the amount of damage. If you are two types and both your types resist a certain type of move, you will be double resistant to that move. In that scenario, you'll take 0.39 times the amount of damage. Finally, and in specific scenarios, some Pokemon double resist certain types. For example, in the main series Pokemon games, a ground type move could not do any damage to a flying type Pokemon. In Pokemon Go, that would be broken. They put it in this category called double resistant to that move. So flying double resist ground. However, if you are flying plus something that actually resists ground, you triple resist ground. In that scenario, you take 0.24 times the amount of damage. So you can do a lot of resisting in Pokemon Go. On the other flip side though, you can do super effective damage. If you are super effective against certain type, for example, ice versus grass type, ice super effective on grass, you'll do 1.6 times damage. If a Pokemon has two types and both those types take super effective damage, then you do double super effective damage. In that scenario, you do 2.56 times damage. There are all sorts of type in Pokemon Go. There's dual types, there's single type Pokemon, and it is a very complicated thing to learn. The best thing you can do is just practice, play a lot. You'll learn what Pokemon do well against others, but that's generally the mechanics of it. Now we also have another stat that can affect damage in Pokemon Go and that is called Stab. Stab is same type attack bonus and this is when the actual type of your Pokemon comes into play. You might have been thinking, you know, give a fire type Pokemon like Ninetales a water type move. Why not? It's perfect coverage. It's a great move, but you're missing out on something important. Stab. Same type attack bonus means you are using a fast move or a charge move that shares the exact same type with that Pokemon. If you have a fire type Pokemon and you're using fire type moves, you qualify for Stab. If you have a fire type Pokemon and you're using water type moves, you do not qualify for Stab. Stab will make all of your moves, both fast moves and charge moves, do 1.25 times damage. So generally, throwing fire type moves from a fire type Pokemon do a lot more damage than some other type Pokemon. Next.
Next up, debuffs and buffs in Pokemon Go. Yeah, you thought it was simple, right? No, debuffs and buffs are a thing. How does it work? Well, there's certain charge moves that you can throw in Pokemon Go that will buff your stats. It's generally just your attack and defense or will nerf your stats, your attack or defense. Also, there are some moves that you can throw that can debuff your opponent's attack or defense, but I don't think there's any that can buff your opponent's attack because I don't know why you would want to make your opponent do more damage. There are two types of buff in Pokemon Go, stage one buffs and stage two buffs. Stage ones, of course, will buff the a little bit and stage twos will buff even more. Stage one buff is 12.5% and a stage two buff is a 25% increase or decrease in a certain stat. By the way, this does affect the current state of Pokemon. So if you use a buff and you go up 25% and then the next time you use a buff and it goes up 25%, you're adding 25% onto the already 25%. So it's kind of exponential. Okay, how does this look though? Stat rose slash stat fell is gonna be a stage one buff. So if you see, you know, your Pokemon above it says stat rose, that means you went up one or, or vice versa, down one, and same with your opponent. Stat sharply rose or sharply fell is going to be a stage two buff. It's gonna be double buff. And finally, I actually kinda of lied. There is a stage three debuff on certain moves in which you can debuff yourself minus three, and that is gonna look at stats severely fell. So technically there actually is three stages. Now, one thing to note, anything past four stages will not affect. So if you use a, you know, move that buffs your attack by two stages twice, you're up four. Anything else after that will not buff you anymore just to prevent, you know, anything going going haywire and being broken. Also, regardless of whether a opponent blocks or doesn't block a charge move with a shield, buffs will apply to your opponent or to you. There's no way to block a buff or debuff from happening. Finally, very important, whenever you switch out of your Pokemon, buffs will reset. Yes, there is a way to reset buffs. So if you drop your defense by two and you're like, I don't wanna play the rest of the match with no defense, well, just swap out. This can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. Sometimes you'll lose your attack buffs, but sometimes you'll lose your defense buffs. If you have a move that will debuff your defense, you wanna spend all that time with max defense building up to two charge moves, then you can throw them back to back. So between those charge moves, when you are debuffed, your opponent has no chance to do any damage to you. Then once you've thrown both those charge moves and you're severely debuffed, you'll swap out to reset it. And honestly, I think that is all to cover for the beginner level. As long as you know all of that stuff and your typings, you should generally have a decent idea of how to play PVP and maybe win a couple battles. But it's a lot more complicated and there's a lot more strategies than it comes to. And that's a perfect segue into the intermediate tips and tricks in Pokemon Go PvP. Let's get right into it. Number one most important strategy to know is going to be a thing called baiting. No, it's not the thing you get at the fishing store. By teaching your Pokemon two charge moves, you have the option to bait. And this is when you're going to build up to the hard hitting charge move, the one that will just boom, that earthquake that'll just send that opponent flying. But then you wanna throw the charge move that costs less energy and will do less damage. Why is this a good strategy? Well, your opponent will see you're building up a lot of energy and they'll know you have the potential to throw that threatening move. So they'll get scared and they'll shield. This is where baiting comes and it's all about baiting out shields and getting your opponent to use shields on moves that don't cost a lot of energy or, you know, don't do a lot of damage. What you use your shields on can make or break the match. So this is why it's so important to bait in Pokemon Go and always build up to the hard hitting charge move when you can. Now, obviously this strategy is completely useless when shields are gone because your opponent can't block it, but this is great in the early game to try to pull out those shields using bait. To better understand this technique, let's just give you an example. Let's say we have Galarian Stunfisk versus Galarian Stunfisk, which is a very bait dependent matchup. Both Galarian Stunfist are going to charge up a lot of energy all the way up to that Earthquake. But then you're going to throw the Rock Slide. Why? Well, Earthquake actually does super effective to the opponent's Galarian Stunfist. Meanwhile, Rock Slide is resisted and does not a lot of damage. But Rock Slide costs less energy. So you're throwing the Rock Slide here. The opponent's going to be scared and they're going to go ahead and shield. Then you can build up simply to the Earthquake, throw the Earthquake and land that hit to do a lot of damage and maybe even take them out. Over on the other end of it, it can get mind games with you. Sometimes you have to take that risk and not shield to prevent not getting baited. The worst thing that can happen in some games is when you get baited. It just feels so bad because it's such a waste of a shield to shield a move that's not going to do a lot of damage. I also just want to add in here another strategy I like to call the fake bait. This pretty much involves you building up enough energy to throw a move that you could potentially have, but you might not have it to fake your opponent out. A great example is with Garatina with Shadow Force. It takes about 12 Shadow Claws to throw a Shadow Force. So building up 12 Shadow Claws before you even throw a move on Garatina can fake your opponent into thinking you have Shadow Force, even though you're running a completely different from Garatina moves. It's honestly a strategy that requires a lot of mind games and even sometimes luck, but make sure you take advantage. Next up, let's talk about a strategy called counting. And this is a way to kind of prevent baiting sometimes. Now, you remember earlier we said every single fast move generates a certain amount of energy and every single charge move takes a certain amount of energy. Well,
Well, with this information, you can find out how many fast moves a Pokemon has to throw to actually have that charge move to be able to throw potentially. For example, it takes eight mud shots for Galarian Stunfist to throw an earthquake. But let's say you see your opponent only throw five mud shots. And by the way, you can see the actual attack animations if you're wondering how you know. You can actually see the mud coming out and every fast move has a different animation. Well, by counting those fast moves, if you see that Galarian Stunfisk only build up to five, you know that's impossible to be a earthquake and you can just go ahead and not shoot. Now, counting is something that takes a lot of time to practice because you have to learn every single Pokemon individually. Galarian Stunfisk takes five mud shots to the rock slide and eight mud shots to the earthquake. Machamp takes five counters to the cross drop and seven to the rock slide. Sometimes even counts will switch. For example, Talonflame takes three incinerates to get to a flame charge, but then the second flame charge only takes an extra two incinerates. This is because the energy counts from the fast moves doesn't always align perfectly with the charge move, so sometimes it's a little bit less to get to that second charge move. I'm gonna throw on screen a chart of very common Pokemon with the amount of fast moves they have to do to get to their charge moves. It's a good strategy to just practice every time you see an opponent's Pokemon, counting their fast moves, learning the counts of different Pokemon, so you can prevent getting hardcore baited and know when Pokemon are at certain charge moves. Now, one thing that is hard to count though is going to be one turn fast moves. Since they happen every single 0.5 seconds, it's like almost impossible. You see Dragon Breath, you're like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, blah, 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 blah. like you're, you can't keep up. So strategy top players use to count one turn fast moves is to actually count your fast moves when you're throwing them and then you can know how many turns have gone by and how many fast moves they've actually thrown. You know, if you're a five turn fast move and you throw two fast moves, that means 10 turns have passed, which means they've thrown 10 of that one turn fast move. So that's pretty much counting, study those charts, learn all of that. It takes a lot of time, so be nice on yourself, but that is definitely an intermediate strategy you need to know. Next up, let's talk about CMP tie. And this is something you will hear a lot in the community. CMP tie stands for charge move priority. And it pretty much is for a very specific instance. When two trainers click on their charge moves at the exact same time, CMP tie will decide which one gets to go first. This can be very important because let's say shields are down. It's a final charge move. You guys are building up, building up, building up. And you guys both get to your charge move at the same time you click it. Whoever gets to throw first wins that matchup. How is CMP tie decided? Well, CMP tie is decided by the attack stat of a Pokemon. Pokemon with the higher attack stat in Pokemon Go PvP will get to throw their move first. Now, there's a lot of different factors that will lead to a certain Pokemon and if they win CMP tie or not. Of course, their base attack, of course, their IVs will play a role as well. I will put an infographic on screen breaking down the general range of attack stat of certain Pokemon so you can get an idea of what Pokemon will generally win CMP more than others. For example, Bastiodon will almost never win CMP tie. Now, we will talk about PvP IVs in a little bit and you will understand why having more bulk is more important, but sometimes having an attack weighted Pokemon is useful because you can win CMP tie. CMP tie can be very important in mirror matches as well. For example, Galarian Stunfist versus Galarian Stunfist, which we covered, because it'll decide who gets to throw that earthquake first, which could decide who wins that matchup. Couple things about CMP tie though. Number one, your buffs, which we talked about, buffs, debuffs, all that stuff does not affect CMP tie. It always goes off your actual attack stat on that Pokemon. Number two, shadow doesn't affect CMP tie. If you have a shadow version of Pokemon, it will be doing more damage and taking more damage, but that shadow bonus does not affect CMP tie. Again, it just depends on that Pokemon and the IVs and the base stats. I also just want to add in here for the people wondering if you have the exact same attack stat, which can be a situation that happens, CMP tie will be decided randomly. Normally it's obviously decided by the highest attack, but if you guys have the exact same attack, it'll just be a roll of a dice who gets to go first. Now this is a perfect segue into our next point, which is going to be a strategy called catching and sack swapping and all that stuff. Remember we covered swapping and you could swap every single minute in Pokemon Go. And swapping can be a very effective strategy. Say you are counting your opponent's Pokemon fast move and you know they're gonna throw the Earthquake and they're running a Galarian Stunfisk. If you know that that Galarian Stunfisk is gonna throw the Earthquake and you're counting one, two, three, and they hit eight, you can swap into a Pokemon that resists Earthquake. This forces your opponent to throw that Earthquake since they tapped on it. But since the game prioritizes swapping over throwing charge moves, you're able to catch that charge move on another Pokemon and it'll do resisted damage, saving you a shield. This is a top tier strategy and can be the difference between winning some big games and losing some big games. Sometimes the finals of regional tournaments are decided off of these plays. Honestly, the reason it's so good is because your opponent is wasting all that energy on a Pokemon that resists that charge move. Now, before we talk about how to counter catching moves, let's quickly talk about Sack Swap. Sack Swapping is very similar to catching, but it's when you have a Pokemon in the back that doesn't have a lot of health. Say you have your Pokemon full health and you have a Pokemon in the back, not a lot of health. Sack Swapping is pretty much intentionally switching into that Pokemon to pretty much sacrifice it to the gods and get your opponent to spend all the energy. It's similar to catching, but it's done in the late game when you have one of those extra Pokemon in the back that you can catch on and can be the difference between winning the game or not because it's technically considered a third shield. It's your opponent's throwing all that energy at a Pokemon with not that much health, so they're not getting their full bang for the 
extra buck out of that charge move. Great strategies to learn. Obviously they have to be implemented with counting as well because you have to know how much energy your opponent's Pokemon is at. But if you can learn to count charge moves and you know when your opponent is at a certain charge move, you can master catching by just simply switching into Pokemon that resists that type of move. Now, how do you counter swapping? Number one is gonna be called a technique called over farming, which we covered earlier. By over farming and not just throwing charge moves when you get to them instantly, you're able to kind of trick your opponent and get them off count on how much energy you have. It's honestly good practice to never throw your charge moves the second you have them because then your opponent will catch those charge moves and pretty much knows when you're gonna throw that charge move. Number two is going to be to lock Pokemon into their fast moves and throw charge moves when they're locked. Remember we talked about earlier when you tap your phone screen, you're stuck in that fast move and you cannot do anything until you're out. Say your opponent Pokemon has a five turn fast move. Well, wait until they throw that fast move and then midway through that fast move, you can throw your move. Since your opponent's Pokemon is gonna be locked into that fast move, there's nothing they can do except accept their fate and take that charge move. It might require you to stop tapping on the screen and not use your fast move so you don't get fast move locked, but it's a great strategy. Now, one of the final general things I wanna talk about in the intermediate section is gonna be PVP IVs and how to build actual PVP Pokemon. In Pokemon Go, you want PVP IVs, and this is generally considered low attack, high defense, high stamina. Now, to be more specific for the Master League, you never want this because Master League has no CP cap, but for any league with a CP cap in which a Pokemon you are using maxes out above the CP cap, you're gonna want PVP IVs. Why is this? Well, simple term is that the attack IVs you have in Pokemon Go contributes a lot more to your CP. Well, having those attack IVs in Pokemon Go PVP will allow you to win CMP more often, yes, but will not contribute to your bulk. So generally having attack IVs is not useful. Also, there's a hidden stat in Pokemon Go called your level, and that can be increased by powering up Pokemon. Since there's a CP cap, you wanna be able to power up your Pokemon to the highest possible level before hitting that CP cap, because that will mean your overall stats are higher. Since attack contributes so much to your CP, any Pokemon with a high attack stat will be always maxed out a lower level. That's why you wanna get rid of the attack IVs and go with PVP IVs, aka low attack, high defense, high stamina, because this allows us to power up our Pokemon to higher levels, allowing us to have more bulk and tank those charge moves more often and get those clutches more often. Although you will lose CMP time more often if you do have low attack IVs, I think it is worth it to run PVP IV Pokemon in Pokemon Go because you'll have more bulk. You can use websites like Go Stadium that will break down the perfect IVs, the best possible IV sets. We call them the rank ones for each Pokemon that I will link below. Finally, I'm going to leave a link below to my PVP IV guide explaining more in depth on how this strategy works if you're still confused. I understand it is a very complicated topic, but just generally know low attack, high defense, high stamina is gonna be better for any Pokemon that maxes above a CP cap for a league. By the way, an example of not that is gonna be Umbreon in the Ultra League, which maxes out actually under 2,500. So in that situation, you actually want max attack everything you want a hundo. And that brings us to a couple final tips for the intermediate section. Number one, there's a lot of lag in Pokemon Go PVP. So here's a couple strategies to kind of reduce it. Number one, of course, get good internet. Number two, turning off location can actually sometimes help your PVP because it doesn't load anything in the background. It doesn't know where you are. So it kind of focuses more of that energy into Pokemon Go PVP. Finally, number four is play when the servers are kind of light. Generally later at night works, like in the midnight, you know, morning sometimes, but just kind of avoid community days, go battle days, you know, days when a lot of people are PVPing. If you really want to win, it's unfortunately actually not the best time to play because there's just so many people on the Pokemon Go server. Niantic are continuing to try to improve lag and that might be something if you're a new PVPer you might experience. So those are some tips you should take advantage of. Number two, something called top lefting. This is not really a strategy, but top lefting is when you uh, quit the game in the top left, you can forfeit a match. When you realize you've lost or you're about to lose or you know, the game is just not going well for you or you know, you know, it's just game over and there's nothing you can do. You can do something called top lefting. This will save you and your opponent some time in just completing the match. Although I don't always recommend top left because it is nice to run it out to the end. Who knows they could lag out and you end up taking the win. That is still something some people do take advantage of top lefting. Next up, how to get past rank 20 in Pokemon Go. This is something a lot of people in the intermediate level will have to worry about. Once you hit rank 20 in Pokemon Go, you will be introduced into the ELO system. ELO is a system popularized in chess that pretty much means anytime you win a match, you go up the ELO and anytime you lose a match, you lose ELO. If you actually beat an opponent that's a lot better than you, you gain more ELO than if you were to beat an opponent that is kind of near your ELO and same for losing. But just generally know to go up to rank 21, 22, 23, 24, legend, all that stuff, you want to win more games than you lose. It's simple as that. Ties, by the way, do not affect your ELO. They do not count as a win or a loss, just neutral. Ties, by the way, only happen when you KO both Pokemon at the same time with a fast move. It's very rare. Finally, let's talk about when games go to time in Pokemon Go. There is a 240 second timer on PvP matches and generally you won't be hitting it, but when you have some tanks like Umbreon versus Umbreon, you know, it can waste some time. Once the timer runs out, the winner will be decided by 
die first, the player with the most Pokemon. So if you have all three of your Pokemon left and they only have one, you will win. And number two, if you guys both have Pokemon, your HP gauge. I think it's a percentage thing. So it's actually not like if you have the Chansey and they have, you know, a really frail Pokemon, it's actually the percentage. So if you have a higher amount of that bar and then they have, you will win. Although games don't really go to time that often, that is how the winner is decided. Also, finally, at the end of every single Pokemon Go PVP season, you get end of season rewards. These rewards usually include Stardust, you know, some items, some Elite Charge Jam sometimes, Fast Jams, all that stuff. But you get a lot of Stardust. You can multiply the Stardust with a Star Piece. Every time a new season starts in Pokemon Go PVP, before you enter the battle menu, make sure you throw on a Star Piece to get extra Stardust. And that is all I think you really need to know about the intermediate level. Take all those strategies and you have no problem hitting Ace, even hitting Veteran. You know, just choose some popular teams by some YouTubers and take all those strategies and you can win a lot of games. But what if you want to hit legend? What if you want to dominate your opponents? Well, in comes master tips and tricks. Now, me personally, I am not a PvP master. And I know that. The highest I've ever hit is around the 2400 ELOs, which is high, but it's not as high as some people out there. And that's why I want to pass it off to my good friend, Dan Ottawa, who is a avid PvP player. I believe he hits legend almost every season and knows a lot and even has a YouTube channel link below. Thanks, Daxi. I'll take it from here. Hey, everyone, it's Dan Ottawa, and I'm here to discuss the more advanced mechanics of this game. And these tips should help you, in my opinion reach minimum 2500 and push towards legend quite honestly because this game a lot of people think it's tap 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 it is not it's quite a skilled game and if you can master these things i guarantee you you will push to legend so the first thing i want to talk about which is the most important part of this game outside of knowing your typings is team building if you can team build properly uh, and know how to use the team well, a lot of people what they do is they go to see content creator teams or they go to pv poke and they're like oh this is supposed to be a good team why isn't it working for me you really need to know how to master the team and how to use the team properly so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go over different styles of teams, give some examples of how the teams work. Hopefully that will give you an idea of how to build teams for yourself. So the first team is what we call a balanced team. So some use letters A, B, C, basically the A and B Pokemon, the lead Pokemon, and one of your two back Pokemon counter each other's weaknesses. And the C is a safe swap. So I'll give you an example of a famous line is Swampert lead or Skarmory lead. Skarmory is the other Pokemon that covers their weaknesses and stabilizes your safe swap. So basically what happens is you have Swampert, which is double weak to grass. If it sees a blade of grass, it essentially faints. So you cover that weakness with Skarmory. Skarmory is a flyer and a steel, so that will double resist the grass. So that is great. And then Skarmory is weak to electric and it's weak to fire. So you have the Swampert, which is water ground, will resist those. So that basically they counter each other's weaknesses. And then you have Sableye, which is one of the best safe swaps in the team. I'll go over safe swaps and leads and enclosures in a minute. That is a very common team. And how the team works is you, you lead, let's say Swampert. If you see a grass, you go into Sableye. If you don't see a grass and you're in an okay matchup, like there's other bad matchups like Dragon resist water. So you probably switch into your Sableye if you saw an Altaria. But outside of that, you can just kind of stand with your Swampert, do that battle, and then decide in the back end what you want to do. And I like these teams because it's, it's again, it's very straightforward. A lot of these other teams I'm going to talk about, there is some maneuvering around of when to switch. But for the most part, in these balanced teams, you stay in if you got a good lead, you stay in if you have a neutral lead, and you play it out. If you have bad lead, you switch to your safe swap. And that's kind of why I like balanced teams. Another kind of common pairing is Altaria, Glare, and Sunfisk. Glare, and Sunfisk is weak to water, it's weak to fire, it's weak to ground. Altaria resists all that. Altaria uh, is weak to charm, like fairy. The steel in Glare, and Sunfisk will resist that. So those are sort of a good pairing. So two common pairings with Carby Charlie's weakness and a safe swap. The second team is an ABB style team. So what that means is you have two Pokemon of the same typing in the back and a counter the weakness on the front. So the most famous line is Grass Hole. Bastion, double grass. Two grass in the back. You can use Venusaur. You can use Tropius. You can use Shadow Victory Belt. So how this works is you lead Bastion. If you do not see a flyer or you don't see a fire, you immediately switch into the, one of the grass Pokemon. They will probably come in with something that will beat you. Hopefully a flyer. You lose that matchup. You then come in with Bastion and just take all the damage because the flyer is not really going to hurt Bastion. And then your second Pokemon will hopefully roam free. So that's how ABB style teams work. Another example is Fairy Double Ghost, right? So a Zoomer lead and two ghosts in the back. So choose your two ghosts, Cofagrigus, Trevenant, etc. Trevenant comes out, uh, hopefully you draw out a dark and then you're a Zoom you lose that matchup, a Zoomer will come back in, wall the dark, and then you have your Cofagrigus or whatever other ghost Pokemon to roam free. The ABB style teams are good to sort of counter the balance because if you have a weakness in the back, it's unlikely they'll have two counters to that in the back. Uh, it's a little trickier because it's, it's not as straightforward. There's some scenarios where you have to like, should I take a charge move? Should I do some chip damage as we call it? Just like a little bit of damage. It's not as straightforward as a balanced team. And that's why these are a little trickier to run. And the sort of the third one is an unbalanced ABA team. So I'll keep the Skarmory and Swampert example, but we'll put those in the back for now. So they'll cover each other's weaknesses. And then you have another similar typing in the front. So I'm going to use a zoom roll as an example. Because what happens is if you see a grass on the lead, you can't use Swampert, right? Because if you see a grass on the lead, you have nothing to sort of deal with that. If you have an zoom roll, it's tanky enough to take a charge move and you have 
have ice beam so you can still do good chip damage to the to the grass so why you li like to run these teams is is if you do see a grass on the lead you can still do a bunch of chip damage with a zoom roll and you'll then have your swampert hopefully i'm assuming they will not have a second grass in the back to roam free so that's how aba teams work and then they're sort of like mix and matching like you can do a triple team i think there's a famous triple uh like water team in ultra league with uh swampert gyarados and maybe wall rain they all share the same typings but they all have the secondary typing so the ground on swampert will resist the electric you have wall rain which is an ice so it can deal with the grass if you see them and then you have gyarados which is also half flying so those are the different team builds learning how to use these teams are important and this is sort of why practice makes perfect what separates sort of the best players with these teams is they've played thousands and thousands of matchups that they know the matchups like they know if they see if they're using the swampert uh sableye skarmory line they know immediately when they need to switch they know when they need to stay in they know the different like damage another thing i want to talk about is lead switch and closer pokemon there is no sort of rule you have to lead this pokemon you have to use this as a switch pokemon you have to use this as a closer but there are sort of best practices so elite pokemon is a pokemon that one of two things either is going to get a lot of shields or is going to have a lot of winning matchups so swampert i mentioned as a lead pokemon because the hydro cannons are such a hard hitting move and they're very very fast to get through you can get a lot of shields or a lot of damage on your on your opponent or you can use something like an altaria is another elite you lose to registeel and glance Stampfist, and you lose to fairies outside of that it has a lot of winning matchups so you want to use a pokemon that wins a lot because what that allow you to do is always take that switch advantage so if you have a pokemon that wins a lot you can take that lead win align your back line how you want it take that switch advantage so that's the importance of a good lead so a lot of leads that you'll see are again swampert's a good lead uh altaria is a good lead glaring stunfisk is a decent lead registeel was a good lead metacham is a good lead since it has a lot of wins so those are a lot of pokemon that you'll see in the lead the safe swap is a pivot the safe swap is a pivot that you need to go into if you have such a bad lead matchup and what these safe swaps will do is for the most part they don't have a ton of just super super hard counters that you're automatically going to lose or get sort of walled and they can potentially flip switch like i mentioned in the sableye matchup sableye is one of the best safe swaps because even against a, a fairy and a zoom roll you could take the two shield if you play that properly so switch pokemon are those that don't have a hard, lot of hard losses and can flip switch so examples of those over time have been mew was one of the first ones vigoroth pelipper lickitung now drapion sableye those are the sort of pokemon that you should start thinking and see if you have that you can use as safe swaps now, pokedoxy is going to add in a quick tip here and why we have safe swaps and that's because they have neutral matchups a huge mistake a lot of people do is when they see a bad lead they switch into their hard counter for example you see a grass type on the lead and you're leading a water type you go into your fire type but these people forget that if they're running a grass type they're probably running a counter to fire types so that's why you always go into your safe swap because then they're just going to re-counter you when you go into that pokemon and closers closers are the last one so closers are pokemon that with sort of shields down they are going to dominate so you can use this in one of two ways the closers can be either extremely fragile pokemon with nuke move one of the more fun ones to play with is zangoose zangoose with sort of close combat is going to one shot a lot of things another example example is let's say electivire electivire with wild charge is going to nuke a lot of things so those are extremely frail pokemon your opponent doesn't have any shield you're just going to nuke everything a second way to look at this is bulky pokemon just with like decent charge moves and i don't say bulky pokemon like trevenant is not a bulky pokemon it's bulkier than the other two but uh registeel zap cannon focus blast is going to do a lot of damage in the back if their opponent doesn't have any shields playing stunfest with earthquake and rock slide potentially combo there is a good closer pokemon too those different types of pokemon are ones that you want in the back shields down will allow you to sort of close out the matchups with either nuke moves or can take some damage and get off a lot of hard hitting charge moves the second thing i want to talk about is win conditions i can't go over every specific win condition because there's thousands there's when you need to catch when you need to farm down when you need to sack swap like there's just so many different examples but for the basics there are three advantages in this game that you always need to consider to help you win switch advantage shield advantage and energy advantage so shield advantage we discussed that you start with two shields so if you can force your opponent to use their shields that puts you at a shield advantage if you haven't used yours there's switch advantage which just means that you get to choose which pokemon you want to align on their pokemon so let's say your lead pokemon wins the matchup and they have to come in with one of their back pokemon once your lead pokemon uh faints then you have your decision of which two back pokemon you want to align which is good because then you can align typings and the third is energy advantage fast move gives you energy and those energies allow you to get charge moves and charge moves are really what's going to help you win this game for the most part how do you think about those so let's say you have a save Sableye versus Skarmory matchup on the lead. Your, your Sableye versus their Skarmory. What you can do is you can get off two foul plays before they get off, say, two sky attacks, and you could take switch advantage. You both have the same shield advantage. You would take switch advantage. What would then potentially happen is they could come.
come in and farm and get an energy advantage. So you'd have switch advantage, they would have energy advantage. What you could also do is a potential option of farming down. So basically what happens is you throw one foul play and then you just shadow claw all the way down. Problem is they will now get a second move off that you will now need to shield. So you could shield that move, go down shield advantage, take them out with the shadow claws, but then you will have switch advantage and you will have energy advantage. Your Sableye will be at about 100 energy so that whenever they come in with something, even if it's going to be a Pokemon that is going to hurt you like a Charmer, you'll still have probably a return to throw at it and do a ton of chip damage there. So there's no set formula here and that's why wind conditions are a little tricky, but just think in your mind, how am I going to play this out in terms of switch, shield, and energy advantage? And there is only one example I can give you of when you absolutely need to fight for switch advantage. And I'll give you the example of the Skarmory Swampert line. So you have a Swampert lead, let's say you lead it into a Venusaur. You have zero shot against a Venusaur. You're just going to get lit up. So you need to switch to Sableye right away. Let's say they come into Azumarill. Although it is a fairy, your Sableye could beat Azumarill in the two shield. That is an example of when I am 100% fighting for switch. I will use both shields and I will do, I will bait if I have to. I need to win switch because my Swampert has absolutely no matchup against the Venusaur and my Skarmory is going to dominate it. So I will fight tooth and nail to win switch advantage there. So those are the three things. Always keep that in mind. Energy advantage, shield advantage, switch advantage when you're playing GBL. Dax did ask me to talk about one more thing and that is the optimization of fast moves. So as Dax already talked about, fast moves come in five different turns. So one, two, three, and four, and five. With these, you want to try to minimize the amount of extra energy that your opponents get. Let's give it a few examples. In two turn fast moves, automatically you cannot do anything about it. So if I have a two turn fast move and you have a two turn fast move, if we both get to the charge move and then one of us throws a charge move and the other one throws a fast move, that fast move will go through. The only thing that you can do to deny it is CMP. So if we both have two turn fast moves and we both get to the charge move at the same time and we both throw the charge move at the same time, then no one will get that fast move in. Where it gets a little trickier is when the fast moves are different durations. So two versus three, two versus four, just whatever example. What you want to do is you want to minimize the amount of sort of turns or energy that your opponent gets. So you do that by optimizing move timing. So let's give the sort of easy example using just even numbers, two and four. I have a two turn fast move and you have a four turn fast move. I want to optimize you getting the least amount of energy. I need to throw on one, three, five, seven, nine, basically odd numbers and never throw on even numbers. Cause let me give you an example of what happens if I do. If I were to throw on my two, so I get two, two. And by that time you're finishing your first move four. If I were to throw my char charge move then, you would get the full four fast move turn. And that is a lot of energy generation to give up. So another example, you can see two versus three. So what you want to do is if I was the two turn fast move, I want to throw one fast move, which is two and then throw my charge move. So that way you only get that one little bit. Getting that extra fast moves, especially for these longer turn moves, three, four, five is deadly. And that's why you want to optimize fast move timing. I think Wallower has a very good video on it. I think Daxi is going to link it in the description below of how to optimize fast move timing on all these different fast moves. And that is pretty much it guys. Hopefully you guys have learned a lot from this video. It took me a long time to put all this together and huge shout out to Dan Ottawa for helping out. I also want to give a huge shout out to Bertram who messaged me on Instagram and told me I think it's time for an upgrade PVP video and also sourced a lot of this information and helped us in the planning process. So huge shout out to you. That's going to be it though, guys. Comment below if there's anything I missed, any other strategies you want to share with the community on how to get better PVP and good luck. Good luck, man. There's a lot of regional tournaments going down. We have Japan 2023 for the championships. It's going to be a great season of PVP and honestly, there's not really really a better time to get into it than now. And I believe it's only going upwards. Have a major day, guys. Follow some more tips, everybody. Peace. <laughs>